You know, as we heard in the first message about Jesus Christ being our Passover lamb, and we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb, you know, we are called to, through him, produce fruit, to be doers of the word, to be living God's way of life, which is made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we're told over in, in a number of places in the Bible, but I just want to refer to Matthew chapter 7, verse 19, where it says that in relation to us and being a tree and us producing fruit through Jesus Christ, it says every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It's burned up. Burned up with fire. Now, it does say good fruit, and the fruit is produced. The fruit that we want to produce is good fruit. And we come to understand in our calling that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength so that we can love our neighbor as ourselves. So we can get, uh, so we can stop producing the wrong works, the bad fruit, and producing the good fruit, and focusing on our neighbor as we truly focus on ourselves. You know, the ultimate thing that we want for ourselves is eternal life. So for our brothers and sisters and those in the world that are not called yet, who treat us, you know, in the world, who may not treat us so well sometimes, our whole desire is for them to be in God's kingdom too. And that's how we live, that's how we act, and that's how we give of ourselves. And we know at some, to at some time when Christ opens their mind, that they too will know his plan of salvation. And we know that for this reason, we needed a Savior to help us to understand and see, to see that, and to know that. In Luke 2, 11, I want to read, it says, For this is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. A Savior. We need a Savior. The world needs a Savior. It's through Him that we can have life. Revelation 1, 5 says that we were dead in our sins until we are washed clean. And that is through a Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about there. And over in Luke chapter 12, there's a parable. It talks about that in our calling, we're giving much. We're given a lot in this calling. God, Jesus Christ, gave of himself, gave of his life so that we could receive the Holy Spirit. So we could receive part of that divinity. God the Father and Jesus Christ are divine forever. We are not. But through that power, that Holy Spirit, them living in us, they give us a taste of that. And if we reject it, we can be thrown and burned up with fire. So, in Luke 12, it talks about that those of us in a parable waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, waiting for his return, and we're thinking that it's close, and then it's not, and we give up. We don't live. We're not fully dedicated to giving our lives to God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. Luke 12, verse 43 says, Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. We are to be living, producing fruit, becoming more Christ-like. Down, drop down to verse 47. And, and that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. In the middle of verse 48. But every, to everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So as we know God's way of life, we are to be living it. And as we grow in God's way of life, we are to continue in it. God continues to give and treat, teach us His way of life to the point where we're to be growing to the fullness of Christ, becoming Christ-like, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 and over in Galatians as well. So, the Passover season is upon us. 
We've, given, we've been given the Passover lamb. We've dedicated our lives. We've made the commitment at baptism and received the Holy Spirit to continue on this path. So as we approach the days of unleavened bread, and soon to be keeping the days of unleavened bread, let's look at the importance of eating unleavened bread. Now, there's different directions you can go with this particular topic, but yesterday I took a few minutes and asked my wife, how do you make bread? And I made a piece of flatbread. It didn't take that long, it doesn't look that good, but I made two pieces and it must have tasted pretty good because the kids ate the other piece. <laughs> but all I did, it was just a little bit of flour, water, and just a dash of oil and I added salt for a little bit of uh, flavor. And it is flat and it is hard. I cooked, overcooked it a little bit. But this is unleavened bread. This is what we'll be eating. It, it has no baking soda, no leavening or anything like that. It's just leavened bread. Unleavened bread. Okay, so I want to turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 to get this started and ask the question, you know, because we've been called. We know what we're supposed to be doing. God doesn't want us to add anything to His Word. He doesn't want us to delete anything from His Word. He wants us to be living His way of life. He wants us to be coming out of this society. We've made a covenant contract with God. All right, and that's what Paul's talking about, chapter 12, starting in verse 22. He says, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all. So we've been called to this calling. Our names are written in the book of life. To the spirits of just men made perfect. So we're called to become a new creation. To Jesus, the meditator of the new covenant. To the blood of the sprinkling, sprinkling that speaks better than the things that of Abel. So it's through Jesus Christ. It's through the word of them living in us that we're able to be able to produce this fruit. We can't do this on our own. It's impossible. And continuing in verse 5, it says, See that you do not refuse Him. See that you do not refuse God, Jesus Christ, who speaks. This is talking about, in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ spoke to Israel. For if they did not escape who refused Him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from Him who speaks from heaven? God leads us through the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shall not only, sh only the earth, but also heaven. And the earth was shaken. The people were scared. But there's a time coming when the heavens also will shake. The heavens and the earth. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, <clears throat> as of things that are, that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Talking about those who stand fast in the Word of God will not be shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Accept Him in reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Now, we know through the pages of the Bible there's individuals who offered strange fire and died. And we tell our children when they're around fire, to respect fire. Don't get too close to the fire. You fall in, you're going to get burned. Stay away from the oven. Don't get too close. Quit horsing around in the kitchen. Stay away from the fire. You're going to get burned. We learn to respect fire. God is a consuming fire. If we don't respect God, we'll get burned. The ultimate thing for us is if we continue in that process and don't repent, we'll be burned forever. So God says, He is a consuming fire. 
So with that thought, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is in the New Testament church where individuals were not keeping the Passover. They weren't respecting this consuming fire, this God. They weren't following his direction. They were implementing their own ideas and their own thoughts. They were casual about it. They were getting burned. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord, and Paul said here, I received this instruction from God, which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. So this is the night, Passover night, the Passover symbols are being instituted. And it's talking here about the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken. You do this in remembrance of me. So again, Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Lamb, this Passover is all about him, and we are to do it in remembrance of him. We are to follow his instruction. Why? So we don't get burned. It says, as we go through here, in the same manner he also took the cup after he sapped, saying, The cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do... As often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat, the, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We proclaim Jesus Christ as our Passover lamb. He's the one who's able to forgive us of our sins and help us to grow and change and overcome through this process of becoming more like him. In verse 27 it says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So he says, let a man examine himself. And sometimes individuals examine themselves and say, I can't take this Passover. And they opt out. When the thing, what we need to be doing is, we've made that commitment at baptism, We've had our sins forgiven. We've received the Holy Spirit. And Philippians tells us, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, that we are to go forward. We're to forget those things in the past. Repent and go forward and move on. We come to recognize and understand that through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, He teaches us humility. He helps us to see. And if we can't see it, if we made this commitment, he will show it to us. He'll try to do everything he possibly can to help us to see that we are sinners and that we need him. And we need to take this Passover and renew our commitment that he is our Passover lamb, that we've surrendered to him. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So we do this. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Some here were, they weren't following the direction. They were making it into a big supper, big meal, in which that has nothing to do with the Passover service that Jesus Christ instituted. We're to follow it exactly and to live exactly as Jesus Christ tells us how to live. And that's through humility and surrendering ourselves to allow him to live in us. To allow him to teach us. Because it goes on to say, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. In other words, if we know what to do when God shows us and do it, God would not have to correct us. He would not have to chasten us. But when we are judged, in other words, when we are corrected, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So there's times where we don't always follow God, but we have the Passover lamb who guides us, who directs us, who shows us when we're doing things wrong, and that we can change and we can repent, and that we can give God the credit. And even when we do things right, he gets the credit, not us. Our, our righteousness is like filthy rags. So, 
as Mr. Elliott was talking about in the announcements, I don't need to turn over there, but he referenced, you know, Exodus. You know, we are required to eat unleavened bread on the first night of uh, the Passover. It tells us that in Exodus 12, verse 8, and it talks about eating unleavened bread. It talks about getting the unleavened out of our homes as we work ourselves up to the days of unleavened bread and keeping the unleavened bread and products out of our homes. And Paul compares our deliverance from sin through the sacrifice and help of Christ in our lives to the deliverance of Israel coming out of Egypt. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Page back. He writes, Moreover, moreover brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers, talking about ancient Israel, when Israel was coming out of Egypt, they were under the cloud, they all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual rock. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So they followed Jesus Christ, or they were to follow him. They followed him, but they complained. We're to follow Christ and our calling and coming out of sin and becoming more like them as just as they left Egypt. They left sin. In our calling, we're called to come out of sin. They were called to come out of Egypt, to cross the Red Sea, to go into the Promised Land. You know, they left Egypt. They wandered in the desert. They could have just went right to the Red Sea and crossed. But God let them wander in the desert probably for about six days before he allowed them to cross the Red Sea. And so they were murmuring and they were complaining. God doesn't want us to do that. As God calls us and works with us, he wants us to go forward, to trust him. And that's what it's all about, trusting him and the understanding will come. So in our calling, as this many baptism as Christ was leading Israel through the Red Sea, as they're going through the Red Sea, what was buried in that sea? We had a type of sin. We had Egypt. We had a type of Satan, Pharaoh, just as when we are baptized and we are buried under the water. We, our sins are buried. We leave behind that Egypt. We leave behind that father, that old father, Satan. It's buried. And we march. We go forward. And in our calling, we need to be led by Jesus Christ. So it says Israel is led, led by Jesus Christ, but without the type of groaning and complaining and looking back. We are to go forward. We are to be led by Jesus Christ and live God's way of life. So just as you know, we are to get sin out of our lives as we come up to the Days of Unleavened Bread, we're to... You know, get rid of sin and replace it with righteousness, right? We get rid of the old leaven and we put on the new leavened bread, unleavened bread. Get rid of the old and put on the new. And our, pers and our goal is pursuing the fullness of Christ so we can reach that reward of the kingdom of God. And in Scripture, our Savior... You know, bread sometimes represents Jesus Christ. There's symbolism in that meaning. As an example, we have our daily bread. Uh, Jesus Christ, Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. Jesus Christ is the one who created us. He's given us physical life. He takes care of us. Um, later in that chapter, verse 25, uh, he tells us to not worry that he will take care of us, he'll feed us, not to worry about what we will wear. You know, don't worry about your life. I'll take care of you. So he takes care of our physical needs. And as, we, as he takes care of our physical needs, he provides for our spiritual needs as he calls us and we respond to him. As, as Christ was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, you know, Satan was trying to tempt him to eat. You need to eat. You know, turn these stones into bread. And Christ said, no, I'm, you know, you're not to be, you know, Christ was tempted just as we are tempted. No, 
We're to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We put God first. God will take care of our physical needs. And then we also have, in symbolism, Jesus Christ states that he's the true bread, that he's the bread of life. And John 6, 32, starting with 6, or 32 through 35, we're told to not, as he's fed the people in the desert after feeding the 5,000, they wanted to con continue seeking Jesus Christ. They were seeking him originally, asking him questions, saw that he was a prophet, and were seeking some of the spiritual things, and Christ fed him. And then after he fed him, they came back and were seeking the physical. And Jesus Christ says, Most assuredly I say to you, after they made the statement that, hey, what sign will you give us? You know, our fathers had a sign that bread came from heaven, the manna. And Jesus Christ says, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This is the true bread, Jesus Christ. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never, never thirst. Christ, you know, through that Holy Spirit, he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, of power, of comfort, of peace. He gives us the fruits of the Holy Spirit, that they become a part of us and we live and display in our lives. You know, that comes through Jesus Christ. That comes through us seeking Him. And then we have the living bread and also the unleavened bread. John 6.51, Jesus Christ uses this as He's preparing, talking about the Passover symbols, of the unleavened bread. In John 6.51, He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, if anyone eats of me, He will live forever. If we follow Jesus Christ and live His way of life, we will live forever. We have to truly come to a full surrender and yield to them and allow them to live in us. It says, He will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. This unleavened bread, we partake during the days of unleavened bread, that we take at the Passover service, it represents, Passover service, it represents Jesus Christ's broken body. And through his, this unleavened bread that symbolizes his broken body, it also symbolizes us, it symbolizes the church, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit of them living in us, the days of unleavened bread. And this is what we eat during the days of unleavened bread. That his broken body helps us, it stitches us back together to become more like him. And the things that we do. He's the one who feeds us and guides us and directs us. So just as we need Jesus Christ every day, throughout the day, as we seek him to become more like him and ask for forgiveness and direction and guidance, as Israel is coming out of Egypt, as we have been baptized and received God's Holy Spirit, we need the unleavened bread. We need Jesus Christ. We need this bread that symbolizes him and all the meaning, a part of it. So when we eat that during the days of unleavened bread, we can think about that. What does that bread represent? In the Bible study course, Lesson 12, God's Festivals, Keys to Humanity's Future, regarding the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I want to read a couple of sentences here. They talk about the leavened bread represents the wrong motives, malice and sin, wickedness that we desire as well as we are tempted by. Okay? Unleavened bread represents having our hearts filled with sincere motives and eagerness to apply the pure truth revealed in God's word. They say the feast on unleavened bread's main focus is on Christ as our deliverer and our savior. The Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrates Jesus' role in helping us to remove spiritual leavening, including malice, wickedness, and hypocrisy, hypocrisy from our character and replacing those evil qualities with godly obedience, love, and truth. 
So, just as we are striving to put the old leavening out, putting sin of our life, we need to replace it with, with righteousness. We need to be seeking righteousness. As we're told over in Matthew chapter 5, that we are to be seeking the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We need to be seeking that in our daily life, becoming more like Him. And we're able to do that through the Holy Spirit. Now, one purpose for the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to remind us that after we accept Christ's sacrifice at the time of baptism, we must allow God's Spirit to help us to grow and to become more like Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, 15, quoting says that we are to speak the speaking the truth and love that we may grow up in all things into him who is head of the church Jesus Christ so we can focus on that as we want to grow and become more like him as we put sin out of our lives and put him into our lives so as we continue this walk and we continue to become more like Him. We've made a commitment to have Jesus Christ live in us. Galatians 2, 2, 2 Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, talks about us being crucified with Christ. That it's no longer ourselves that we serve, but that we serve the living God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live is the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, it's them living in us. It's helping us to grow and to change and to overcome. And it's important to understand that the Feast of Unleavened Bread celebrates those who are Christ's. Those who are being you could say it's a miracle to be delivered, to be coming out of Egypt, to be coming out of sin and becoming more Christ-like. You know, three things that we can look at during this feast. When we are sincere and true repentance, we are delivered out of sin. We accept Christ to lead us out of sin just as he led Israel. In other words, we follow Christ's instructions. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about where individuals, or Paul's talking about, they did not follow God. They complained. They followed him, but with complaining. We're to follow him and going forward and not do that. Get out that wickedness. Putting sin out and replacing it with righteousness. Number two, it reminds us that our deliverance from sin and our salvation are available only through a personal relationship with Christ, the Lamb of God, who took on himself the penalty of our sins. So sin had to be our sins had to be forgiven to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit wasn't offered in general to the masses in the Old Testament, only to a handful. It's through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection as the Passover lamb that we're offered this, but we too must be called. As our high priest, number three, as our high priest, he actively helps us, if we really are his servants, to put the leaven of sin out of our lives so we can come, so we can become spiritually unleavened. You know, we have this opportunity, just like mankind has this opportunity, you know, eventually they too will be able to understand and know God's way of life. And, and through this process, when we're, we respect God, we respect fire, you know, we, don't, we teach our kids. God is teaching us to respect Him. We have parable, parables and symbols from the physical to the spiritual. And we understand and recognize that we need, we need to be focusing on Jesus Christ, where Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4.13 that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It's through Him who strengthens us. It's through Him that helps us to grow and to change and to overcome and that we are able to find His grace and mercy in the time of need when we go before that throne with Jesus Christ at His right hand, the Father's right hand, to come before them. And that our prayers, as Jesus Christ is able to intercede on our behalf during the days of unleavened bread, the bread that we eat represents Jesus Christ. 
This is a symbol about him and what he has offered us as we partake of that bread on the Passover and continue through the days of unleavened bread. You know, Paul, now we can say, okay, I'm taking this unleavened bread. I want to live God's way of life. I am seeking his way, but I'm struggling. Yes, I think Paul makes that clear over in Romans chapter 7, and we've read this many times, but I think we should turn over there and see that even though that we are desiring to eat this unleavened bread, we're desiring to seek God's way of life, we still struggle. We struggle with our nature, our desires, our will. Jesus Christ even wrestled with that. He never sinned. He never sinned. But he always yielded to God. And God is the one who gave him strength as he prayed to God and asked for comfort before he went through his crucifixion. But in that same thought, Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7, verse 18, For I know that in me, that he's talking about his flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. You know, Paul wanted, we wrestle, we have our will, we have our desires. You know, we are weak. We are to grow in the fullness of Christ. We are, we can't do this on our own. We sin, we make mistakes. Our sins have to be forgiven. We have to be picked up, cleansed, and go forward. But we wrestle. We want to, you know, you know what bread is more appealing you know, we look at the physical part of it. We see that the puffy bread, that's more appealing. That puffy donut looks good, it tastes good. But, you know, that could be appealing to us. But we have to reject it. We have to reject our will and seek God's will. We want to be continuing to be eating the unleavened bread. Paul says, for the good that I will to do, I don't do. What I want to do, I can't do on my own. I need help. But the evil that I will not to do, that I practice. That's what comes of my nature. That's where I'm weak. And that's where I need help. That's where I need my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For I do what, for if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. So I delight in the law. I want to live that way of life. But then he goes on to talk about my mind, my thoughts, my body, my senses. They desire to do something else. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He says, O wretched man that I am, and we are. Who will deliver me from this body of death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we are sinners, and we need to replace the old leavening with the new leavening. We need to be getting rid of the Leavening out of our lives during the days of unleavened bread, which represent sin. Which represent that, that the malice and wickedness that we read about earlier. And we need to be replacing it with the, the true bread, the sweet bread of Jesus Christ, of them living in us so that we can have relationships with one another. So... We are told over in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, that, you know, sometimes we will want to, you know, float, we're okay, we're in the church, I'm fine, I'm doing all right. But, you know, God tells us we're supposed to be producing fruit, we're supposed to become more like Him through a relationship with Him. As this unleavened bread represents, Jesus Christ, as we partake of it and we think on that, it helps us recognize and see that we need him throughout every day of our life to become more like him. Um, Isaiah 58, verse 1, 
cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. That's not easy to do. It's not that we want to be up here and say, you guys are sinners. No, we are sinners. We don't want to practice sin. And what I want to get across today is, you know what, focusing on the symbolism of this unleavened bread that we will partake of during the days of unleavened bread, that it represents our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, so we can have a relationship with Him and a continued relationship with each other. Regarding sin, you know, what sins do we need to overcome? You know, David talks about in Psalm chapter 19, verse 12, that even the hidden sins, the secret sins, the sins that we're not aware of, they too, you know, search me. Psalm 19, verse 12, who can understand his heirs? David says, cleanse me from my secret faults. Cleanse me of those sins that I'm not even aware of. You know, we've been focusing on that and talking about that lately in the last number of messages. But in Proverbs it says, Do not let your heart envy sinners, but be zealous for the fear of the Lord all day. God wants us to be zealous. That's Proverbs 23, verse 17. You know, happy is he who obeys God. That is true happiness. You know, the world is searching for happiness. People are serving money. People are serving their own desires, their own needs, their own power. And it's all at the expense, in a lot of cases, of other people. It truly is. And that's what we need to get out of our lives, is becoming more like God and all that He has to offer. So, we want to, as God says, I am a consuming fire, we want to respect God and not offer strange fire. We want to follow His instructions, live to Him. And if we're not sure about something, if we want to make sure, we're not sure we're doing things right, we just keep obeying God, that understanding will come. Just as Mr. Armstrong kept the, you know, the holy days for a number of years before the understanding started to come, that's what happens. You know, sometimes God way, you know, this is what we need to be doing over here, but God allows things in our life. He allows things in our life for a reason. He tests us, help, and through that testing we can recognize and see, what evil am I thinking? Just, you know, today, I mean, for me it's like, wow, you know, I thought I was okay. You know, we're, my son and I, we were reading Luke chapter 15, on the way to services and we're talking about you know the parables and the meanings and going through with them and showing love and kindness towards other and desire for others to be in God's kingdom but what came to my mind and sitting in there sometimes I can be critical of someone and it's like wow God shows us we keep obeying yielding to him living to him and God will show us those sins and it's like it is it's exciting because we want that to happen. We want to grow. We want to go forward. We want that to come from our Lord and Savior, and that's who it comes from. He's the one who shows us how to live. So we don't want to mess with fire. We want to respect fire because God is a consuming fire. And if we don't, just like if we don't the physical fire, we can get burned and die. Okay? So in conclusion, we're required to be producing fruit. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, and it's through him that we're able to produce that fruit. We must be doers. We must be living to God. There's a number of things in the scriptures that we are to be doing and living to. You know, stop doing the old and replace it with new. That's what we do when we turn the days of unleavened bread. As we eat that unleavened bread, we can focus on that. The unleavened bread during these days, it helps teach us the need to continually work to put on the new man, as it says over in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. And that's part of our conversion process, is to become more like Christ. 
In First John, one verses six and seven. It says, we can establish and maintain and improve our relationships with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and each member of the body of Christ. You know, as we walk, as we walk in this, this newness of life, it's something that must become us and desire and want to become more of. And as we walk in the truth, Hebrews 10, 16 talks about, it's through this process that God writes his laws on our hearts and our minds. Under the terms of the new covenant, we desire to become more like Christ. That's what we live for. That's what our desire is, to overcome sin, to become more like him, to help us to see that. So we can focus on that as we eat this unleavened bread during the days of unleavened bread. So, because we want that to be instilled in our heart, that we can live in righteousness to him. So, let's rejoice at this upcoming Feast of Unleavened Bread because he freely gives us all the help that we need in overcoming sin and living to righteousness. Let each of us put on Christ, who is, in symbolism, the bread of life, the true bread, the living bread, the daily bread, and even the unleavened bread. Remember, we were dead in our sins, and we need a Savior. We need Jesus Christ to show us the way. As Mr. Luker always taught from the Bible and Scripture, it's so basic, but so easy to fall short of. He is the one to show us the way. Christ is. We must yield. We must humble ourselves to live that way of life. We need to desire to truly want our Savior in our life. He's the one who gives us what we need. The symbolism of this unleavened bread during the days of unleavened bread, it represents Jesus Christ. It represents the church. It represents us. It represents the Holy Spirit living in us. So as we fully accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So let us not forget the symbolism of this unleavened bread as we eat the unleavened bread during these days of unleavened bread.